as a reminder from last time, uh, last time we talked about line searches um, and we did the Armijo rule, which gets the job done. There's very fancy versions of this, but that one tends to work pretty well. Uh, and then we started talking about last time, both equality and inequality constraints. Um, and we like kind of ended last time by me dumping the the famous KKT conditions on you. Um, and then kind of talking through the interpretation of those guys and sort of all, all what's going on there. And uh, so any questions about any of that stuff from last time? Cool. All right, so today we're going to continue in that van. And today's kind of the last day of our like three-part crash course and optimization. And hopefully after this, you'll be kind of enough, know enough to be dangerous and like get through the rest of the class. Um, though, you know, caveat, there's like, there's a whole field. There are entire, there are multiple entire courses on just this stuff at CMU that you can take. And if you're into it, you probably should take some of those. Um, I highly recommend if you're going to get serious about this stuff, highly recommend taking some kind of convex optimization class at some point in your life, just because it's, it's good grounding and, and whatever. We're kind of very much just just scratching the surface and giving you like sort of the, the cheater notes for, for that sort of thing. Um, OK, so today we're going to kind of talk about algorithms for constrained optimization, like kind of quick survey and then dive into one in particular. Um, and the one that we're going to dive into in, in some detail is called the augmented Lagrangian method. Anyone heard of this before? Nobody. Whoa. I know you, you don't count. Um, which is one of our, it's like one of my favorites. It's, uh, it's nice because it's like very easy to understand. It's like very straightforward to implement and it works pretty well most of the time. Um, so it's, it's, I would say of the like kind of algorithms, the general purpose algorithms for solving general constrained nonlinear programs, this one's kind of the easiest one to get working and the easiest one to wrap your head around. So that's why we're doing it. Um, and then we're going to talk about a very particular class of constrained optimization problem that is super ubiquitous in control. Uh, specifically, it's like the go-to thing if you're doing model predictive control on a robot. Um, and this is called, uh, a quadratic program. Anyone heard of this? Yeah, good handful. We're gonna talk lots about that. We will also use those a ton in the class moving forward. So it's good to kind of um, have at least a little bit of understanding of how those things work. And then we're gonna finish off with some more um, on regularization and line searches. Basically, how do you apply those things in the totally constrained, you know, inequality and equality constrained setting? And after today, you should have everything you need for like the first homework. And in fact, you'll, you should have everything you need from here, the first homework to like write your own solver for a QP um, and actually like do numerical optimization. Not, not bad for two weeks, you know, it's pretty good. All right, so uh, any questions about any of that before we get into it? All right, let's get into it. So. Uh, let's do, we're going to talk some more then about inequality constraints. Just refresher. So any, in, we're specifically what we're doing is inequality constraint minimization. Because we are control people in here. We minimize. Uh, so this is the problem. Again, just talking about inequalities for now. Min of some objective function f subject to some constraint C of X being less than or equal to zero. And then at the end last time, we wrote down these KKT conditions, which, uh, you know, are uber important. So these are basically just like the fancied up version of the gradient has to equal zero at a local optimum for when you have inequality constraints. And 
those just to refresh us and get us back into the right mental place. Um, this is the first one of these is called stationarity, which is just setting the gradient of the Lagrangian equal to zero. So that kind of all makes sense. Uh, the next one is called primal feasibility. And that's just saying that the constraints have to be, oh, we're going less than. I always mess this up because there's, you can do it either way. And I usually do it the other way. So I try to be consistent. Uh, okay, so C for us, we're going to do less than equal to zero in here. Uh, we need the Lagrange multipliers to be positive because they're inequalities now. So they're kind of one sided, like we talked about the end last time. And then we have this last thing that's called complementarity, which says that the Lagrange multipliers times the constraints have to equal zero. So just to remember the names of all these things, this first one, gradient equals zero, that's called stationarity. The second one, that's you know just the constraints have to be satisfied is called primal feasibility. Feasibility just means constraints are satisfied. Primal refers to the x variables. Yep. Uh, so we're not going to use the we're only going to use the nabla notation for gradients. So that refers to the first derivative of a scalar valued function. So like f spits out a scalar. So we write nabla f means the gradient vector sort of transpose column vector. C here, C of x is not scalar value, it's vector valued in general, right? So it eats a vector and spits out another vector. So in that context, we're, we're just always gonna write it with the partial notation. Just to avoid, again, the, the, the nabla notation is only specifically for gradients, right? Make sense? So that partial C, partial x thing is a matrix in general. Oh, okay. Uh, so primal feasibility means the constraints on the primal variables, i.e. the x's are satisfied. The next one's called dual feasibility, which uh, feasibility again mean, means constraints are, satis uh, a little, constraints are satisfied. And dual just refers to the, the dual variables of the Lagrange multipliers. And then this last one that says lambda times C equals zero, this is called complementarity. Or sometimes you'll hear this called complementary slackness. Um, same thing. And um, let's see, things to say about this. There's a couple notes on this. So we said this last time, but just to make sure everyone's cool, this little weird, you know, circle-y dot thing is called a Hadamard product, if you're being fancy. It's literally just element-wise product. So if you have two vectors, you take all the elements, multiply by each other, and you get another vector out, right? So that's called the Hadamard product or uh, element wise. Um, product. And there's different ways to write these things down. You'll see slight variations. Yeah, we're. Uh, sorry. It's an element wise product between two vectors. Yeah, so there's a bunch of equivalent ways to write that one. Um, another way to write it is diag of lambda times c, where diag means you take the lambda vector and make it that diagonal of a of a diagonal matrix. That's actually the way we usually write it in code in like MATLAB or whatever. So you might see it that way. Uh, you can also write it as lambda transpose c, um, where that's a scalar. That be careful with that one though. That one's only legit if. Uh, so this one's kind of just the the most straightforward way to write it. In, in most cases. Okay, so that's, yeah. So in the, yeah, this is a good question actually. So if you got rid of the e the inequality and you did C transpose lambda, that would be sort of orthogonal, right? This is a slightly different condition. So it turns out when you add the inequality of that, it means something a little bit different. It, what it means exactly in this in the in the inequality constraint setting when you have that condition, it means that either one or the other always has to be zero. So element, if you go down element wise, one or the other, either the like lambda i or c i, one or the other always has to be zero. Whereas orthogonality, the whole thing could be non-zero, right? So so if you have lambda transpose c just by itself, that does mean orthogonality. But you have lambda transpose c and 
uh, being like in say the positive or negative orthant, then it turns out that that implies this other thing, right? Which is not orthogonal. Yeah, that's called complementarity. So it's sort of a related idea, but it's like a sort of stricter version of it. Everyone cool with that? Uh, okay, so that's that. And then there's one other thing I want to stress uh, that I think we may or may not deliberately try to mess with you on the homework assignment. So, so beware. Hint. This thing up here, this whole term with the constraints and the multipliers up here. I said this briefly in passing last time, but um, so I, you know, there's a bunch of ways to write this stuff. One of the things that will trip you up, that you look out for, is that the signs on all these things can change. So right there, so right there you know, the Jacobian transpose lambda term has a plus sign in front of it. If I were to get my equation, for example, write it as e of x greater than e instead of less than e over here, I would then fit it with that plus sign into a bad sign. When we talked about this last time, right? The idea here is you want that term to act like a penalty if you're violating the constraint, right? So the way to think about it, and the way to always keep it what happens if lambda is positive and I'm violating the constraint? So if I'm violating the constraint here, C is positive. And since I'm minimizing, I want positive C to be a penalty. I want it to make the cost bigger. Make sense? So positive C, bad. Positive C makes the cost higher, makes it worse. So it needs to be a plus one. Whereas here, if C is feasible, it's negative. And that actually makes the cost lower, which is what we want, right? So that's the way to think about it. So the other way this gets flipped around is if I were maximizing instead of minimizing, then it would also have to flip some, right? If I left everything else alone, I were maximizing. Again, I want to make things worse, which in the max setting means I want to make the objective lower. So just, just keep that in your head. The way to think about it is bad violations of C make the cost worse or the reward lower, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're maxing or minning, it's got to make it worse if it's violating. So let's write that down. This term acts like penalty. And you will absolutely see this the other way around. Uh, so, like, it's very, very common to write it as C positive instead of C negative, and then you'll get a flip sign. On that. It's you pretty much always do lambda positive. That's always that seems to be a roughly universal standard. Is lambdas are always positive, but you'll see C done either way, um, and you'll see min or max, and that can flip both. Whatever combination of those can flip the sign. So, if you go look in a textbook, you might see these written around like the other way around. Okay, so that's just a little refresher. Everyone cool with this stuff? Okay, excellent. So now we're gonna talk about, those are the optimality conditions, right? These are the things that have to be true to have a local optimum. And now we're gonna try to figure out how to solve these things in practice. Uh, algorithms for doing this. Remember like when we had just equalities or if we had no constraints, we just do root finding on this. You know, it's just the first one just a couple of equalities. It's a refining problem, just do Newton. Here though, these inequalities mess us up and we actually can't just apply Newton directly to these conditions. So we need fancier things. So let's talk about the fancier things. Um, so I'm gonna basically just like run you through a laundry list of constrained optimization algorithms that are common. And um, you can look them up if you want more. And then uh, we're gonna dive in in particular to the augmented Lagrangian stuff. Okay, so optimization algorithms. I'll try to give you like a little bit of pros cons for these and sort of when you might want to use one or the other. So maybe the most straightforward uh, one, um, and roughly speaking also, it's kind of interesting to look at these. What all of these are doing is various ways of like approximating these KKT conditions in different combinations, essentially. 
Um, okay, so first one is called an active set method. And the idea here is, um, we talked about last time how that whole, like all this complementarity stuff, all this weird stuff was essentially just encoding switching of the constraints on and off, right? And when the constraints are active, when you're up against the boundary, they just look like equalities. And when you're not on the boundary, they just disappear from the problem and it's just unconstrained. So kind of embracing that viewpoint, um, active set methods, essentially all they do is you have some method for guessing which constraints are active or inactive. So you're guessing, and that's called the active set. The active set are the, all the constraints that are active at a particular moment. So those are the ones that are turned on. And so are equality constraints when they're turned on. And then anything that's not, uh, that's already in the feasible set, that's not up against the boundary, you just remove from the problem. And they are sort of not in the active set. And then what you do is you just solve the resulting equality constraint problem, which we already know how to do, right, from, from last time. So that, um, nice and easy. And like in, in theory, it's super easy. We know how to solve equality constraint problems. So we just kind of keep a list of the active constraints going and, and we sort of switch them on and off. Um, when these are good is if you have a, I mean, as it as you would expect, this works great if you have a good way of guessing the active set. Um, and if you don't have a good like heuristic or oracle to get the active set right, these actually can be, in the worst case, these are awful. It turns out in the worst case, these have like, um, like combinatorial complexity. Basically, worst case, you might have to try every possible combination of active and inactive constraints to get the answer, right? So the worst case complexity is awful. But in practice, you can often come up with good heuristics or good like you know ways of guessing this stuff. And in particular, in a lot of model predictive control applications, we can guess these things really, really well, it turns out. And so in that case, if you can guess really well, then this reduces to just solving one or two uh, un like uh, equality constraint problems, which is easy and we know how to do it, right? Okay. Any questions about that? All right. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is if I if I have an oracle that tells me the active set, the correct active set, then all I have to do is solve one equality constraint problem that I'm done, right? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, so the idea, let's say, I mean, if it's a, I'm not saying, I'm saying like the way to think about that is, is outer loop iterations, right? So here, like, or sorry, inner loop. So the inner loop here is an equality constraint problem. The outer loop is changing the active set and then solving some inner, you know, equality constraint problem. If I can guess the active set right every time, I just have to solve one equality constraint problem. That's great. If I can't guess it very well, I might have to solve a ton of those and try different combinations, and that's terrible. So you can. This works great if you have a good heuristic. And it turns out in a lot of control applications, you can come up with very good heuristics where you can guess right like 98% of the time and then guess it right on the second try like the rest of the time. So there's papers on this where people have done awesome work like this. Um, in particular, there's a there's a paper from Russ Tedrick's lab from my postdoc advisor, Scott Kindersma, who came up with a, a custom solver for Atlas during the DRC where they basically showed, they did a bunch of Monte Carlo testing and showed they guessed the active set correctly on the first try, like 97% of the time. And on the second try, like another 2%. And then on the third try, worst case, like 1% of the time. So, so within three tries, they were they were basically always getting it. And then they could run the solver way, way faster than a sort of stock off the shelf method. So you can do this very well sometimes, but you have to be good at guessing the active set somehow. Yeah. Um, generally, no, but what you would do is you, you, you take a few iterations of Newton until you're like getting close to the answer or you're partially converged and make sure you're getting the active set correct. And how, do you know how do you do that? How do we check if we got the active set right? How do we know if we got it wrong? <laughs> so there's two ways to check. So what we're doing here is we're basically throwing out. So if I get an active set, throw them in as equality constraints. If I missed an active constraint, Will be some if I put one in the active set, 
that didn't follow that. So what that means is I'm pulling it onto the constraint there instead of pushing it. So that comes down to the multiplier sign condition says I should only be pushing constraints away from the constraint manifold. I shouldn't pull them in to the top. So pushing is the positive. The constraint's going to violate it to push it back to the feasible set. If it's already in the feasible set, it's not a predictor. I throw it in there as a the body, I'm going to get a negative sign pulling it into the constraint. That I don't. So if essentially you guess an active set, solve the equality constraint problem, then you check these. If any of these are violated, then you know you need to check these. Uh, okay, so that's active set methods. Uh, Again, super straightforward, but you need a good heuristic, and but sometimes you have that. Sometimes you can be very good at guessing. Okay, cool. So another class of methods that are very, very popular are called uh, barrier or interior point methods. Who's heard of these? Why? Okay, only a couple people. These are like the kind of de facto standard for convex problems. Um, they're extremely popular. And in fact, like these things were invented or they were like kind of rediscovered and popularized in the eighties. And there was like a New York times article about primal dual interior point methods. Like they made the New York times, which is insane for something. So like math B and arcane. Um, okay. So the idea is we're going to take all our inequalities and replace them as the name implies with um, this thing called a barrier function. in the objective. And the way that looks, basically there's one, you could invent other kinds of barrier functions, but there's one that's like everyone uses, um, and that is called the log barrier. And it does what it sounds like. So let's write this down. So this is, you know, min f of x subject to c of x less than equal to zero. What you're going to do is take that c and we're going to get rid of the inequality constraint by doing the following thing. We're going to instead get this new new objective where we take f of x and then we add this new barrier term. So if I have if c is uh, has you know uh, m elements in it, so it's m scalar constraints, I'm going to write down m of these barrier terms. So we've got i from one to m, and we're going to write it like this: one over rho times uh, log of minus e i. So this is just element wise. You're adding this minus log thing to the objective. And let's draw a picture of this. So you can see what it looks like. So remember, we want to keep the c's negative. So there's a bunch of sign, you know, gymnastics in there to make this work out. But the picture is really straightforward. So if I've got um, x versus minus log of minus x. Right, so this is this would be equivalent to you know c of x is just x negative, right? That's what I'm gonna draw. The log thing looks like this. So we've got basically this, it's pretty much flat inside the feasible region. And then when you get close to the boundary, it blows up to infinity right at x equals zero. Does that make sense, everybody? That's what that looks like. And so the idea is I've got this thing that pretty much doesn't affect the answer at all if I'm in the feasible region. But then as I get close to the boundary, it blows up to infinity. And then like basically makes it super, super expensive to violate the constraints, right? And it goes to infinity. So I'll, if I start in the feasible region, basically this thing pr presents like a, a giant, you know, infinite brick wall that I can never cross, right? That's kind of, the, that's why it's called a barrier. And so if I start in the feasible region, I'll never go out of it, given this, this term in the, in the objective. If I do, if I do things correctly, right? If I take good steps and whatever. So there's a bunch of caveats to this. Does everyone get that? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is like the gold standard for convex problem. It uh, it works super well. There's a bunch of fancy theory for these that you can get all the guarantees you could want. So basically, if you have a, a feasible convex problem, i.e. you haven't written down something dumb that has no solution, like this is actually guaranteed to get you the solution in polynomial time. 
So these are super efficient, they're super fast, and they are they're like super robust and all that good stuff. Yeah. So there's another method we're going to talk about that's closer to that. This is um there's a, a better way of thinking about this is it's a like it's an it's a smoothed out version of an indicator function. So an indicator function is like you know the brick wall, right? Where it goes to infinity uh at the boundary and it's zero everywhere else. This is an analytic, i.e. infinite differentiable, infinitely differentiable approximation to the brick wall. Um, and the reason you want that is, well, no, you can do Newton on this. This thing's twice differentiable. I can take a Hessian of it, right? I can do all that stuff. So it's uh, it works great with Newton's math. That's actually the, the key idea is this is basically giving me a differentiable thing that I can take two derivatives of and do Newton on that like gets me an arbitrarily close approximation to the the indicator function, the brick wall. And how close that approximation is is a function of that row fudge factor in there. So the way you do these in practice is you start with a pretty relaxed row. So it's nice and smooth. And you take some Newton iterations. And then as you get close, you start to crank it down. And as you crank row, that that sort of nice smooth elbow it gets sucked in till it's like basically right on up. And if you do it right, you can get answers to like double precision all the good stuff, the full, full floating point, you know, whatever precision you can get the exact answer to as many digits as you want this way. They work great. Um, we're not going to do these out because these, the getting these to work in practice is pretty gnarly. Actually, there's a lot of technical gotchas and like tricks you need to make them work well. So, um, but you should know about them. And if you like go pip install some solver for convex problems, you're probably going to use one of these. So they're awesome for convex problems. Uh, there's a very easy way to understand why they're not awesome for non-convex problems. If I have a non-convex constraint, like think about like, I don't know, an obstacle. Let's say I have like a pole in the middle of the room that I need my robot to go around. This thing blows up to infinity at the edge of the, the constraint. But if I have another side of the constraint over here, it's gonna, that side is already infinity, right? So I can't have, basically I can't make a two-sided version of this because if it's, if it's non-convex, some part of that barrier is going to be infinite everywhere. So it kind of it destroys you. That's maybe not clear, but they, they're, yeah. You can do all kinds of weird stuff in general. There's, but there are, you can, you can make non-convex versions of these ideas. In fact, that's what the IP opt is, if you've ever heard of that. Um, but it's tricky and there's lots of like evil, messy details that make it really hard. Yeah. That's right. It... Yeah, so there's more more to say about it. a lot. This is, gets into these things get really hairy to implement in practice. You cannot ever let X go, go across the barrier in one of these methods because everything blows up. So the way you do that in practice is you need special line search techniques that backtrack until you're on the right side of the barrier. You can never cross. That also means you have to always give it a feasible initial guess that's inside the, the interior, uh, which is also can be tricky. And so there's all kinds of extra tricks you need. There are a whole family of extra tricks called infeasible start interior point methods that let you um, start with an infeasible guess that is complicated. Then there's a whole bunch of line search fancy tricks Blah blah blah. There's there's lots of which is why we're not doing them in class because there's too much of that. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, you can do it. Like these work great in practice. You can make them work, but there's lots and lots of like extra voodoo that you need to do to make them work in practice. I'm happy to talk more about this after if you want. I'm going to show you stuff that is has less sort of like uh, that that, has, that that works a lot easier and has lots of necessary hacks to make it work. Uh, cool. So, but these are cool. You should know about them. Books about these things. Happy to talk more about it if you want to. Okay, cool. So that's, these are good. Um, here's another class of methods that are kind of the most obvious thing to try that you would probably think of off the top of your head, but it turns out they're, they're kind of bad in, in, uh, 
many ways, so you shouldn't do them. These are called penalty methods. And they, at first glance, sound similar to the barrier idea, but they're they're very different in, in a lot of ways, and they're a lot worse. Uh, so the idea here is you just replace the constraints with a penalty term that penalizes constraint violation. And these are very different in a very important way that I'll, I'll show in a sec. So here's the picture of this guy. So what we've got is say min f of x, again, same, same thing. And um, what we're gonna do here is turn this into a, the standard thing would be a quadratic penalty. You can use other like norms, but they're, um, this would be kind of the standard thing. So it looks like this for this inequality, we're gonna have a, a row weight and we're gonna stick a one half in there for convenience. We will come back to this stuff in a sec and some of those constants will, will make more sense. But the idea is, remember we want a one-sided penalty. We only wanna penalize constraint violations. So this is gonna look like a one-sided quadrant. That's what I'm writing down here. So this max thing is, is clipping the penalty to one side so that only it's only penalizing you when C is positive. We're just going to square that. The picture here, which you should kind of contrast with what we had before, is this sort of thing. So this is x. This is my penalty up here. So it will do max 0, comma x squared. So inside the feasible region over here, it's 0. And then zero right up to the boundary. And then when I cross the boundary, it starts to look like a quadratic parabola. Because so the really important distinction between this and the barrier is that the barrier always, always keeps you in the feasible region. And it blows up to infinity at the boundary and you can never go infeasible. This guy does nothing when you're in the feasible region. It only kicks in once you're already violating. Make sense? So this has no penalty if I'm inside, um, but as soon as I go outside, then it starts to crank up. And uh, there's sort of important like little implications for that. Um, so let's write some stuff about this. So first off, I mean, these are super easy to understand and, and easy to implement, that's it. It never acts like a barrier, it turns out. The barrier crucially has to blow up to infinity. This doesn't, right? This only blows up to infinity at infinity, right? So um, the, the, the barrier has to blow up to infinity at like, the constraint boundary, right? So that, that blowing up to infinity thing is a key property. Um, but what you're talking about there, like shifting the parabola over is actually closely, real. it is basically what we're gonna talk. That's kind of what an augmented Lagrangian does, it turns out. Um, okay, so here's the critical, like, fatal flaw of these things that's related to this. These are sometimes called external penalties as opposed to interior point. They only penalize things that are outside the constraint uh, feasible region. Um, so these things, in order to get them to exactly satisfy the constraints, related to that whole idea of the log barrier blowing up to infinity being really important, for this to actually give you exact constraint satisfaction, Turns out you have to jack that row penalty up to infinity. They only exactly satisfy the constraints in the limit as row goes to infinity. So if you ever do this on your computer, it actually will never exactly satisfy the constraints with finite uh, row and floating. So in floating point math, you can never get this to converge all the way. And you have to jack it up really, really big, which makes your, your floating point math blow up. It's called ill conditioning, right? So your matrices will get all nasty and, um, you basically won't be able to solve the problem. Uh, you'll have to drive that thing super big and then it'll just barf at some point. Yeah. If I mean, so literally rho has to go to infinity there. So you'll, you'll never win. Whereas again, be, because the log barrier, the function, the log function itself blows up to infinity, right? It turns out that I can get to converge exactly in, in finite precision arithmetic. This one I can't. 
So that's kind of a key reason, like that's the fatal flaw basically of these guys. So these have issues um, with ill conditioning. And basically can't achieve high accuracy. Okay. Any more questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Um, so let's see, is there a good way to say this? The reason that's true is not obvious, <laughs> but there's, uh, it might become more obvious. So, this is maybe an after class question. I can show you some some stuff that I don't want to get us too derailed. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So the next one we're going to talk about, uh, which is the one we're going to get into some detail on and you're going to implement yourselves. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, that's what they're all trying to do. But the point here is this thing's always going to violate the constraint some amount, and you can never quite get it back all the way because of the sort of need to drive the penalty weight to infinity. You basically should never do this. Yeah, it's like the obvious naive thing to do. But the thing I'm going to show you right now kind of fixes this. It fixes the problems with the penalty method and makes it actually work and gets you good convergence. So you should do the thing I'm about to show you instead of a penalty method. And the thing I'm about to show you is, is the so-called augmented Lagrangian method. OK, so the gist of this is it's based on the penalty method. But what it's going to do is add a Lagrange multiplier estimate to the penalty penalty method to fix this sort of needing infinite row problem. And there's kind of a couple different ways of looking at this. So here's the setup. So we're going to do, in over x, we've got our f of x. We're going to add a new term to this thing. Uh, well, it's not new. Uh, we're going to add this. We're going to call it lambda tilde here to imply that it's like just an estimate of the Lagrange multiplier, but it does converge to the true Lagrange multiplier as the algorithm converges. Um, so there's that. And then we've got the penalty term that we just had, saw in the penalty method. So for inequalities, we get this kind of deal. OK, so this entire thing with the Lagrange multiplier estimate and the penalty term, that whole mess all together and the objective, this whole thing is called the augmented Lagrangian. Because it's it's called augmented Lagrangian because just the f of the lambda term, that's the Lagrangian, right? That we saw before. And now we're adding, so you can think of it either as a penalty method plus the Lagrange multiplier estimate, or you can think of it as the Lagrangian plus this extra penalty term, right? And so we're going to call this L sub rho of x and lambda, I guess lambda tilde. And this thing is known as the augmented Lagrangian. Function. OK, so cool. So the idea is, there's like the key idea that makes this work and, and what's interesting. So we're going to basically start with lambda equals 0. And we're going to solve this problem. And we're going to pick some row to start with. And we're going to solve this. We're going to minimize that augmented Lagrangian uh, with a fixed, you know, with, with lambda fixed at zero just over the, the axis with the penalty term, though, as if it were a penalty method. We're going to do that. And then once we have that solution, we're going to, the intuition is what you're going to do is like stuff the penalty term into lambda. So now we're going to have a non zero lambda and we're going to solve it again. And by sort of stuffing the penalty into the lambda at each iteration of this thing, we're going to converge on the true Lagrange multiplier. And that's going to let us not need to drive row up to infinity. So here's how you actually update lambda. This is kind of slick and worth um, kind of like 
thinking about a little bit more. So uh, remember we saw, like I was, you know, when we talked about this whole like lambda, the Lagrange multiplier term, when we talked about just the Lagrangian in general, we and we talked about the sign in front of the Lagrange multiplier term. Um, I was saying that you want that, that thing acts like a penalty. It very much does act like a penalty in a very specific way. So here's here's kind of, we're going to say you, you want to like offload the penalty into uh, this lambda estimate at each iteration. And so what the the way we think about this is I'm going to write down right now the gradient of the augmented Lagrangian with respect to X, right? So that's the thing if I if I fix lambda and I just minimize with respect to X, these are the optimality conditions, right? It's just the LDX equals zero. So let's write that out. So partial F, partial X. And then we've got the Lagrange multiplier term that looks like this. And then we've got our penalty term. And um, that looks like this, rho times C of X times DC DX. And right now I'm ignoring the sort of switching behavior with the max just to make the notation easy. Um, so if I stare at this for a second, there's a key thing you should notice. That's the constraint call, right? So if you think about it, they have to, right? Like this is the constraint call. They're both pushing me off the constraint. So if I look at that, what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to group those both terms together. I'm going to group the Lagrange multiplier estimate and the penalty term together because they're both multiplying that constraint normal and kind of pushing in the same direction. So I'm going to get this thing. And so now it should be kind of intuitive what the next move is. This whole term now. That makes sense? Okay, so then we're going to take lambda tilde gets lambda tilde plus rho C of X. And then I've got a new lambda tilde. I plug that in and I do this again. Um, and there's a caveat that I, I only do this for the, I sort of skipped some details in here for the inequality constraints. You only do that for the active constraints. And I will write out the full sort of algorithm in sec with that. I want to give you like the intuition first. That makes sense to everybody? Yeah, that's right. So I'm only optimizing over X and I've got this penalty in there that's trying to satisfy the constraints, but not exactly. So I'm gonna solve that problem. At convergence, I have this stationarity condition. If I stare at that for a sec, I realize that the penalty theorem that rho C is doing the same thing as a lambda would. And so I just take whatever's in there and stuff it all into lambda tilde. And now I have a new lambda estimate. I plug that in and I optimize just over X again. There's another interpretation of this that is kind of slick that we should be, I'll, I'll tease it now. So what that second term is, is actually gradient ascent. So we're doing gradient, we're doing Newton on the primals and we're doing gradient, a gradient update on the lambdas, on the duals is what's going on here. It's not obvious yet what's going on, why? And hopefully by the end of today, it will be more clear. This is a weird like primal dual alternating is, is what's up there. So instead of what we did before was joint Newton on the whole thing. Here we're doing primal Newton dual gradient step, which is weird. Turns out it works well, blah, blah, blah. That it, yeah, I don't know. There's lots of ways to like interpret this. Um, okay, so here's the whole thing in like pseudocode. So repeat until convergence. We're going to first do min over x of this augmented Lagrangian with, you just start with lambda equals zero. 
Then we're going to do our lambda update after we've solved that to convergence. So, um, and this is what it looks like to we we basically just need to clamp the lambdas. So you asked before about you know how do we know that the lambdas are correct, or whatever. So this is how you do that. You're going to apply this sort of max function on this guy when you update it. So that's just you you do the update we just said. But you're going to clamp the elements to make sure that they the lambdas stay positive, right? Uh, so let's write that. Oh, and then um, after we do that, there's sort of optionally, you um, you also crank up the row. The penalty. So we might do something like row, set row equal to some alpha times row, where that alpha would typically be sort of like n ish. Cool. Okay. So this um, basically the main takeaway here is that this this scheme where we estimate the Lagrange multiplier in addition to the penalty term it fixes all the problems with the penalty method, basically. So uh, it fixes the ill-conditioning issue. And the reason is that there's kind of multiple ways to think about this. It's estimating the Lagrange multiplier. So if that Lagrange multiplier converges, then the penalty doesn't, you don't need it anymore, right? By no lambda, the penalty goes to zero. So that's kind of one reason. So I don't need to crank row to infinity anymore. Um, and in fact, you can show that uh, this converges to both x and lambda uh, in with a finite value of row. So I don't need to jack it up to infinity. Um, and another cool thing, another way to think about this, um, which uh, kind of came up earlier, is that if you kind of look at this for a sec, you've got this um, quadratic penalty and you can actually regroup the terms in there and write this as like a quadratic plus linear term. And that the linear term there, the lambda, what that's doing, you can interpret that as taking that quadratic penalty and shifting it over. So it's sort of, yeah, I don't know, another way to think about it. Okay, um, and then yeah, this the cool thing about this is it turns out augmented Lagrangian methods are are like kind of uh, like as far as these things go, they're pretty bulletproof. They actually require um, way weaker assumptions of your functions in terms of like smoothness and convexity than a lot of the other methods. In particular, they require way weaker assumptions than interior point methods. So there's lots of problems where interior point methods will blow up and barf, uh, where these things will still work and Lots of, there's lots of nice things about them. So on, on non-convex problems, uh, these still work. And by still work is they'll get you a local op. Non-convex, you can't guarantee global anything, but these will still work. Whereas interior point methods, naively applied, will not work and uh, need lots of extra hacks and crazy stuff. Okay, cool. Questions about this? So this is on the homework for sure, yeah. That's right. These can start infeasible. There's no issues. Nothing goes bad, right, if they're infeasible. Because it's just a soft quadratic penalty. It's perfectly well-defined. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, so it turns out um, for it to converge, based on the problem, there's, it turns out there's a threshold minimum value of row for any given problem that you need to be at for it to converge. And you don't know that a priori. So that's why we do this cranking of row here. Basically, you started at like one or two or whatever. You just crank it up so that you eventually hit that threshold where it's going to converge. Does that make sense? So for a given problem, you actually can figure out what the threshold value is. But that's it's harder to do than it than it is to just solve the problem. So you don't know what the threshold is, but you know that a threshold exists. You just crank it up until until the thing solves. 
basically you would just generally you just want to crank it up until you get some some like large saturation value where you're going to see yield conditions. Remember we talked about like the penalty getting too big causes the natural oil conditioning, basically like lots of point. So you want to get this up to make double precision. Uh, that's fine, but much past that, it's going to start to do bad things to your your max. Yeah. We haven't talked about this in deep. So condition number of a matrix is a specific thing. Yeah, so what we're talking about here is the condition number of a matrix is the ratio of the largest to smallest singular values of the matrix. I should probably have said something about this. So what, what happens, the, the heuristic is, so if, if I have, say it's like, you know, 100, 1,000, that's very benign. Um, what happens is as that number goes to infinity, that means your matrix is singular, aka non-invertible, right? But for, for finite, not infinite values, the heuristic is if you take like the base 10 log of this, so if it's like a million, it would be uh, six, right? Roughly speaking, you lose that number of significant digits in your answer. So if you're, you can do all kinds of tricks, but this ill conditioning phenomenon, what it means is if I have a linear system, AX equals B, and I'm solving for X, if A has a condition number of like 10 to the eighth, it means I'm losing eight digits of accuracy in the answer. So in double precision, I get about 15 or 16 digits. So it means if I'm losing eight, I've only got about seven good ones. And so as that condition number gets bigger, if I, which happens as I crank row up, I'm going to just basically get garbage answers. Yeah, condition number of my matrix that I'm inverting. That's it. That's that's what's going on. So yeah, sorry, if I should have probably said that at some point earlier. Yeah. You can basically just combine everything we're talking about with the stuff we talked about last time um, to do sort of both together. You can actually do equalities with an augmented Lagrangian as well. It works fine. Like you, you just do this and you get rid of all this max stuff. It's just a penalty on the equality. And so this can do both. You can also split them and do augmented Lagrangian on just the inequalities and the sort of standard augmented Lagrangian, the standard Lagrangian stuff on the equalities. You can kind of do whatever you want. Choose your own adventure. There's uh, lots of ways to do it. Okay, everyone cool? Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, Zach, what we're going to talk about now, so that's kind of the survey of, of stuff. Um, you'll do the augmented Lagrange stuff in the homework. Um, what we're going to talk about now then is a specific class of optimization problem that shows up a ton, uh, which are called quadratic programs. And this is um, the following. So if we've got, it's got a quadratic objective function, which is what the quadratic part obviously refers to. So looks like this maybe. Uh, so uh, quadratic in a linear term. And um, for this to be convex, what has to be true about my big Q there? Yeah, so Q has to be strictly positive definite, which is just saying that you need it to be a bold. Right? It has to have all positive eigenvalues, so that it's curving up in all directions. If it were only positive semi-definite, i.e. has a, a zero eigenvalue in there, that means the direction associated with that zero eigenvalue, the corresponding eigenvector, is a valley where it's flat at the bottom, and it doesn't have a unique minimum then. Right. So that's why we require, it's, it's literally just for convenience. It makes the math nice. If we require Q, big Q to be strictly positive definite, it means that this thing has a unique minimum. It's got a single point that, that's the minimizer, right? So for that reason, we we require this to be true. And then um, we're, as part of the definition here, we're allowed to have linear inequality and equality constraints. So we have AX less than equal to B, and we have CX equals D. So that's like a standard form QP. Again, quadratic objective, convex, strictly convex quadratic objective. So we've got positive definite Q, and then linear inequality and equality constraints. Cool with that? That's just the definition. Um, these are super, super useful in control. We're going to see lots of these. 
And kind of the the real like main reason these are super common and super popular is just because we we know how to solve them very well. You can solve these uh, super, super fast. So for like reasonable, you know, smallish problem instances like that actually show up in a lot of practical control applications, you can actually solve these at like kilohertz rates on a sort of standard laptop CPU. So you can easily get these things to run at hundreds of hertz on like real robots. And that's kind of why they're popular. Uh, okay, so we're gonna, any questions about the setup? Cool, so we're gonna do this real quick in code. So um, this is literally the augmented Lagrangian stuff that we just did, just applied to a QP. So here's my objective. Um, it's just, you know, X transpose QX with a made up, I think we, this is the same stuff we did before. Um, and then here's my linear, I'm just going to have inequalities and I'm doing this in 2D so we can visualize it. So it's a 2D bowl and it's because it's only in 2D, I can only have one constraint. Otherwise everything's over constrained, right? So, uh, or 1D constraint. So here's all I've done here. I've written it as AX minus B less than equal to zero to be in the same sort of format as my C of X less than equal to zero that we we're doing before. So that's my constraint. That's my A and B. Um, and then here's the kind of similar to last time. This is the landscape. So these are the level sets of our bowl. And then this yellow line is the constraint boundary. This is an inequality constraint. So in this picture, so as you can imagine, right, like intuitively, the, the minimum is like unconstrained. You don't this here. I have to get this sort of the yellow line, though. So the next is probably out here somewhere, right, that we, we would expect. So we're going to go ahead and try solving this. So here's the augment of Lagrangian. It's exactly what we wrote down, right? So F, and then we've got lambda. We've got our uh, quadratic penalty term. I'm clipping it with this max. So it's one-sided penalty. Uh, and now we're just going to do Newton on that, on the augment of Lagrangian. Uh, so that's all that is. So here's what we're going to do. Um, okay, so yeah, let's we'll start over here somewhere. So like we said, the answer is the true answer is like probably right about there on the boundary. Um, let's take, uh, so here's what we've got. So this is the augment of Lagrangian method. We're going to solve this uh, to convergence just with respect to X. Um, then we're going to update the lambdas by basically offloading the penalty term into the into the lambda like we showed. So that's that line. Um, and then we're going to just kind of iterate it. What I'm going to do uh, to just kind of play around a little bit, what we're going to do right now is we're going to turn off the lambda updates in the row updates. So what we're going to get right now is just a pure penalty method. We're going to check that out. So here's one step of a pure penalty method with like row equals 10. So as you can see, it, it goes right, up, you know, it goes towards the minimizer and it's violating the constraint, right? So if I kind of keep iterating, nothing's going to happen. So I've solved this exactly for that value of row with that penalty. So it doesn't go anywhere, right? What I can do now is if we want to try like what a penalty method would look like on its own, I can turn on these, these row updates. So what this is going to do is jack the penalty weight up by a factor of 10 at each solve. And what you'll see is that that's going to make the penalty steeper and start pulling me back towards the constraint, right? Let's try that a couple of times. You can see getting closer, getting closer. And what'll happen here, right, is it's it, row's gonna get really huge. It'll get me closer and closer, but it'll never get there. And it'll have to jack row up to gigantic values to kind of get anywhere, right? So what we can do next is let's sort of start it, start it back. We can do both of these together. And what you'll see is, so here's the first step. It's exactly the same first step as we saw before, but now what I'm going to do, I'm going to update my lambda. So now I have some estimate of the Lagrange multiplier in there, and I'm going to also jack the penalty up at the same time. Then, so if I take another step, I'm basically right on. If I take another one or two, you'll see it's it's converged, right? It's giving you like the exact answer. Um, interestingly, we can spit out that lambda and the X, and you can see that basically this is all converged. So you've actually converged on the exact Lagrange multiplier and like the exact solution here in, a, in just a couple iterations. So if I could run this one more time, you can see this isn't this isn't moving, right? I've, I've got the exact answer in like, you know, three, four, five iterations, whatever. So an interesting thing though, that, that's kind of fun to check out. Let me start this over one more time. What I'm gonna do now is I'll take out the penalty update. So, so what this means is I'm no longer jacking the penalty up at all. 
I'm just doing the Lambda updates where I offload. So there's no ill conditioning, you know, weirdness here. So again, same exact first iteration, but remember when I left the penalty update off with just the penalty method, it doesn't move anymore. It stays stuck there. But now with the Lambda updates happening, you can see I start moving, I actually converge again to like the exact answer without even having any, any big penalty. But we can look down here, uh, we're not quite there. So the convergence is slower, but it's uh, still working, right? And we're, we're getting pretty close. So the, the kind of takeaway is I can converge with fine, a finite row. I don't have to jack the row up super huge. And I get both the Lagrange multiplier and the, the, the tree solution. Kind of the interesting takeaway though is you get the fastest convergence when you update both Lambda and row together. And you can actually prove that if you do both of those things, you actually get super linear convergence, which is really good. Super fast. If you're only doing the Lambda updates and not the row updates, it can still converge, but you're going to get slower. You'll get a slower convergence rate, like a linear convergence rate. All right, yeah. You're going to probably get like, I mean, it, it, so it depends on the problem, right? But the reason you want to start small is that big values of row give you ill conditioning and you get bad steps because of the numerics. You actually want row to be as kind of as small as possible, uh, such that you still get a reasonable. But we start with it small and we kind of only jack it up as necessary with a bunch of like safeguarding and, and checking and stuff. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the cost function. Yeah, that, that Q matrix is just, it's the weight on my quadratic term, right? So I have X transpose QX. It's literally just, if it were a scalar, it's literally Q times X squared, right? So it's just the like matrix vector, higher dimensional Y. If you have like your quadratic formula, like AX squared, BX, we'll see, it's the A. It's the thing multiplied by the X squared. So that has to be positive for it to be a bull facing up. That's, that's it. That's why in the matrix, Case, it's got to be a positive definite matrix, which is the matrix version of a positive. If it's negative, it pulls this way. And then it's not, then the minimum is negative infinity. That cool with everybody? Okay. So we got quadratic program. You'll see this a ton. These are the most useful thing. If you get nothing else out of this class, you should know how to do QPs and do like linear MPC, which we're going to do next. Um, and then augmented Lagrangian. Uh, like these are really straightforward to code up and they work. Like, so don't ever write down a quadratic penalty. They suck. Uh, this is a very, very easy, like two extra lines of code that like makes it, makes it nice and sort of fixes all the badness. So you should just do this if you're ever tempted to do a quadratic penalty. So don't do penalty methods. Don't do forward Euler. Is it like the, you know, rules to live by? Okay, cool. So just to kind of like, you should go play with the code as usual and try all this stuff, right? So um, you should try just the penalty. You can do the full AL thing with the penalty and the row updates. And you can also try with just, just Lambda updates and kind of see what, see what you see. Okay, everyone cool with that? We're going to switch gears now to like a slightly different topic that is, so we're going to start talking about like what regularization and line searches look like in the constrained optimization setting now. And to get into it, we're going to, um, there's sort of a fun little segue into some, uh, some optimization theory. So we're going to talk about how to regularize uh, one of these KKT system things. Like we talked about last time, right? Remember we got stuck on that uh, weird problem where we, we got stuck in some weird infeasible point and we said it was because you had to regularize. So now we're gonna sort of talk about how, how to do that. So to get into this, um, let's just talk about the equality constraint case. So we've got min of x, min over x, f of x subject to c of x equals zero. So back to where we were last time, and like the way we're going to sort of ease into this is, so we just talked about all these things with penalties and barriers, right? So if I were to like, in theory, make up the best penalty ever, I might want to do something like this. 
Um, I might like to make up a penalty function that basically that like brick wall infinite penalty thing that uh, also known as an indicator function that blows up to infinity when the constraints are violated and is zero otherwise. So I'm going to call that P infinity of C of X. Cool. And, you know, we can define it, sort of, you know, like this, it's zero if, you know, if the constraint satisfied. So if, if C of X is equal to zero. And then it's plus infinity otherwise, basically C of X not equal to zero, right? If the constraints violate it. Okay. So, so this is like, you know, a theoretical idea that you obviously can never do in real life because it's sort of terrible. Um, but it gives us some interesting kind of insights. So basically, practically terrible. Uh, but we can get the same effect as this infinite penalty thing. by solving this, this other problem. So check this out. So if I, um, if I, if I kind of go back to my Lagrangian thing and write down the Lagrangian here, I'll maybe I'll just write it. So if I have F of X and then I have my Lagrange multiplier term and I solve this thing where I'm min over X, which is what I was doing before, but then inside there, I'm doing a max over lambda. It turns out this gives me the exact same thing as the infinite penalty. The way to think about it is if C is zero, then that max over lambda like doesn't do anything. I can make lambda whatever I want. It doesn't affect the at anything. But if C is any non-zero value, if I'm violating the constraint at all, that inner max over lambda blows up to infinity. The solution to that is infinity, right? So this mini, and this is called the mini max optimization problem, right? It's got a min and a max. So, so does everyone see how that works? Basically, like with this setup, this is a problem I might actually be able to do something with, solve, right, in principle. And it gives me the same behavior as the infinite penalty thing, right? All right so write that down. Uh, whenever C of X is not equal to zero, the inner max problem blows up, AKA has, has an infinite value. Um, you can do the same thing. So this is the equality case. You can do the same thing for inequalities with just a small tweak. So that looks like this. We've got min, uh, subject to B of X less than equal to zero. I can write that as min over X max. Oh yeah. So I guess if I, let me write the whole thing then. We've got uh, this sort of infinite penalty thing again, but it's one-sided now because of the inequality. So to sort of, I'm going to write this as P infinity plus, meaning it's only penalizing positive stuff. So this is zero if D of X is less than equal to zero and it's plus infinity otherwise. So if C of X is positive, cool. So same idea, but now it's like a one-sided version and I can do the exact same mini max trick with like just one small tweak. So the only difference is now I'm doing max over uh, lambda subject to lambda has to be positive, which is very familiar to us from our KKT conditions, right? And same same deal in here though. And so same kind of deal, right? So basically, if um, if C is negative, which is feasible, that's what I want, and lambda has to be positive, the optimal value of that inner max is zero. Like I can't do anything to make the problem worse, right? If I make a big lambda, a big positive lambda when C is negative, that's actually helping me. It's making the cost lower, right? So if I'm trying to maximize the cost subject to lambda, if C is negative, the best thing I can do is set lambda to zero. 
which turns off the multiplier complementarity, blah, blah, blah. Um, whereas if C is positive, which is violating, now C positive, lambda positive, I can jack that up and blow the cost up to infinity, right? And make it make it bad. Does that make sense to everybody? Let's see how it works. So again, like I'm getting the effect of that infinite sort of crazy infinite indicator function penalty thing with a like seemingly reasonable formulation, but I've got this like mini max problem now, right? Um, okay, so yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm solving the max I'm the inner max first. So I'm maximizing that with respect to lambda and whatever that is, then I'm that then is after I complete that that maximization operation, I've like maxed out lambda. And then it's only a function of x after that. And then I'm meaning the resulting function of x. Does that make sense? It's nested and it the order matters. There's a case where you can flip the order, which is a fun thing to know that. Okay, we we'll maybe talk about that in a sec. So the key thing here, yeah. Where? This thing is for equalities. And then down here, we did it for inequalities where it's got the less than, right? So both cases, there's slight tweaks. So there's a key, key takeaway from this, which is, um, this is exactly the problem I'm solving when I solve the KKT conditions, right? That KKT system thing we did last time. So these are the things I'm, this is what I'm solving. I solve for both X and Lambda together when I solve the KKT system. The question is, when I solve that root finding problem for the KKT system, what sort of stationary point am I finding in both X Lambda space? If we're minimizing with respect to x, so that's the bottom of a bowl. But what about the lambdas? Yeah, so we, so in the x directions, it's it's a minimum. In the lambda directions, the maximum. So altogether, in both x lambda space, what kind of point is that? The saddle point, exactly. Yeah, so... This kind of gives us this interpretation of the KKT system or KKT conditions. So KKT conditions define a saddle point in like X lambda space when I do this jointly over X and lambda. So now, this tells us how we need to regularize the KKT system. So uh, if that's true, what does that tell me about the eigenvalues of the KKT matrix? Nope. So if I'm, if I'm minimizing, I want the bowl to point up, which means positive eigenvalues. If I'm maximizing, it needs to be the top of a hill. That means the bowl's, it's not a bowl, it's a hill. It means it's got negative eigenvalues, negative curvature, right? So if it's a saddle point, what do the eigenvalues have to look like? How many of each? Exactly. Does that make sense, everybody? So it's minimizing in the x dimension. So in the x directions, all the eigenvalues associated with the x's have to be positive. And then in the lambda directions, all the eigenvalues associated with the lambdas have to be negative, right? That's that's it's a saddle in x lambda where it's a min with respect to x. Everyone got that? Cool. So KKT system should have sort of dimension of x positive eigenvalues and dimension of lambda negative eigenvalues. Uh, at an optimum. So this has, it shows up commonly enough that this has a name. So we, we talked about positive definite means they're all positive. Negative definite means they're all negative. This is called a quasi-definite linear system.
Okay, and so if I need to regularize that KKT system, which I do in general, um, what I'm gonna do is I need to add a regularizer, a positive regularizer to the X stuff, the top left corner. And I need to subtract, I need a negative regularizer in the bottom right corresponding to the lambdas. So I got a minus beta I here, like, that and then this is you know the thing we were doing last time so this is our delta x uh delta lambda and then this is minus grad l minus v of x and this is beta for some you know beta positive right okay so let's go show you the code for this so let's see so now we're going to go back to the, the same exact problem we were doing last time. Very similar setup, uh, quadratic objective, but now I'm just making the constraint nonlinear and weird. So we run into these problems. So the same thing as last time, we got this equality constraint where I have to be on the yellow curve. Uh, I'm going to write down my Newton stuff. And remember last time we tried this where I started up here. And if I just do Newton on this guy, I'm going to, you know, it looks all fine, but if I take a few steps, I'm going to start. Uh, headed the wrong direction. I'm eventually going to get stuck in this weird spot over here. Right? Remember from last time? Okay, so if I check the Hessian, um, I check the uh, eigenvalues of my uh, KKT matrix, how many positive and how many negative eigenvalues should I have? So X is 2D, B is 1D, the lambda is 1D. What should I have? Two positive, one negative. Sure enough, I've got two negative, one positive. So this has a bad curvature direction. And it means it's like, you know, go in the wrong direction, which we saw in the in the scalar case before, right? So here's what we're going to do. Uh, it's exactly what we did last time, but we're doing different signs in, di in the different blocks, right? So regularize Newton step, we're computing the Hessian, and then we're adding this positive beta i, negative beta i in the corresponding top left, bottom right blocks. And I'm doing something super dumb here, right? I'm literally just, I, I compute the eigenvalues and I check the, the numbers of each sign. And I do this until I have the right numbers of both. This is a very naive way to do this, right? It's kind of dumb. In a real deal, large scale setting, you wouldn't do this because it's more expensive to compute those eigenvalues than it is to actually invert the matrix itself. So don't do that, but there's, there's better ways to do this, but just for kind of illustrative purposes. So now let's do the exact same thing again. Start at the same spot and let's see what happens. Uh, so we'll take a step, take a step. And now you can see it, it's already looking a lot different, right? So I'm I'm getting to like the right solution. Cool. So I landed at the true optimal this time. So the regularization, again, you know, before it was in the scalar case or whatever, it was always to make us head downhill. Similar idea here, but it's a little trippier. This is basically making me always head toward a south the correct kind of saddle point, right? So I'm I'm sort of gonna always land where at the right spot where I want. This is just the equalities. Yeah. So the, the same story applies in both cases. It's just easier to demonstrate in the in equal in the equality only setting. In the if you have mixed equality and equality, same story, you're you're gonna do the same thing. You're always gonna basically put the regularizer, a negative regularizer on the bottom. You're always going to go to a local optimal. With, with if you do this, so this is basically just guaranteeing you that you head towards a local optimal instead of getting stuck in a weird spot, right? Because you're going the wrong direction. Yeah. Nope. Nah. I mean, I just did that here for. There's lots of this. I'm showing you like the simplest version of this. You would do this like fancier ways with smarter implementation, you know, et cetera, in in real life. This is sort of the basic idea. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, right? This still does this nasty overshoot. Remember, we talked about line searches before. This is just doing the regularization. I still need a line search here. And I think we're out of time, right? So we'll do the line search for the constraints case next time. 
That's the last piece. Then we're done. Then you know all the things. So we just need to fix that overshoot problem with the line through. 